Welcome to Real Foot Forward, a West Tennessee podcast from Discovery Park of America in Union City, Tennessee. Today's episode is brought to you by our friends at Leaders Credit Union. Thank you, Zach, and welcome to Real Foot Forward, a West Tennessee podcast where we explore the history, the people, and the culture of our home here in West Tennessee. I am your host, Scott Williams. Okay, Zach, before we begin, as usual, what is something you have discovered here at Discovery Park of America? Well, uh, growing up, learning about David Crockett, since mm-hmm. we're talking about him today, I wanted to learn something about him. Uh, but I did, when I learned about him growing up, all I heard about was mainly the war hero he was and how successful of a hunter he was. I didn't realize until doing some social media for Discovery Park recently that he dedicated one third of his life uh, to public service. And he was Congressman Dave, David Crockett. Um, that's a really great uh, thing you discovered. Uh, he was my ancestors congressman. And wow. so he represented, I'm, I'm assuming they voted for him. Probably <laughs> they did. Um, he, he won one term, lost the term and then won the next term when he lost the next time he infamously told everybody where they could go and he was going mm-hmm. to Texas. So, uh, of course here at discovery park, we have the, uh, statue, the David Crockett statue. We have an exhibit on David Crockett, um, we have uh, the film on David Crockett, the painting. Of, so we we are all about that. We even sell raccoon skin caps in our gift shop. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's very appropriate since we have a very, very special guest today. We're going kind of Hollywood, but actually Nashville. Um, our guest today is American screenwriter, film producer, producer, executive producer, entrepreneur, Derek Purvis. Derek is the producer director of the just released action pick, The Ballad of Davy Crockett. I love the fact that uh, you were living in the place where they started filming on Golden Pond, and that was your inspiration. Tell us a little bit about that. Wait, where'd you hear about that? I don't know. I was researching you just a little bit. <laughs> well, that's online? Yeah, somewhere. Oh. Is it yeah, true? Yeah, 100% true. So I grew up in New Hampshire in a small town called Holderness, uh, probably 25, 3,500 people, uh, residents. It had two beautiful, pristine lakes, Little Squam Lake and Big Squam Lake, and a small, about a tenth of a mile river channel that connected the two. And on that little river channel is where the town kind of grew up. So the town is built on a very small bridge that goes across that canal between the two lakes. And when I was 10, a feature film called On Golden Pond came to town. And I was just sort of enamored with the process. Now, here's the thing. When I tell most people this, I'm sure they think of all the glitz and the glamour and the lights and the movie stars. And to be honest with you, uh, it was a great experience because I could see immediately. So one the, the detail I failed to mention is my stepfather at the time was the Marine patrolman for the two lakes. It was so slow that basically that as the police officer, his job was to make sure the buoys were in the right place all the time. That was kind of his only thing. <laughs> so I spent the summer on that police boat and, and all around the production, just watching the entire thing unfold. I got to see that it's actually a blue collar business. You know, it's a lot of hardworking guys running cable and putting up stands and light stands and camera equipment and rigs and dollies and jibs. And so it wasn't my my first introduction to the film industry wasn't on the predicate of all the glitz and the glamour and the fame and the wealth. And I'm going to roll. People are rolling in on, you know, Lamborghinis with big giant. It was just more of like a family of people in the trenches. And I became enamored with the process at a very young age and spent my entire life pursuing it. What a great film to be able to cut your oh teeth on yeah. to watch. Absolutely. Yeah. And masterpiece at that. And to meet Henry Fonda was amazing. Um, you know, I, I did not get to meet Catherine Hepburn. I did meet Henry Fonda and Jane Fonda and, you know, all that stuff. Uh, so that, that was a ton of fun. And, and he was a, a great fellow. Another classic story, actually, there was this old wooden, uh, boathouse that he would 
make his way down to in the morning and sit by the boat waiting to be taken out to go to set. And he's very old and he's very sickly at this point. He's coughing a lot and he'd have to sort of like compose himself, do a scene and then back to coughing. But one morning he's sitting in the boathouse. His wife is standing in the doorway of the boathouse. And I'm 10 year old boy that kind of sheepishly walks up and is looking past her to him. And she is just going up one side and down the other side of me of like, can't you see he's sick? How dare you? He's got to get to work. He's working 12 hour days and now scoot along, little. Now, shoo, shoo, shoo. She's trying to shoo me away. And behind her is Henry Vonda sitting on the end of a boat, kind of bobbing just very slightly. And he's coughing and he's looking at me down the gangway and he's waving me in towards him while his wife is trying to shoo me away. So I can, I'm like, do I listen to him or do I listen <laughs> to her? And so, of course, I just sort of boop sidestepped her and went in and he gave me the tassel and, you know, gave me a couple minutes of just, uh, you know, I can't even honestly, I don't remember the exact words that were said um, because just the feel of acceptance and warmth and human, like, it was really awesome. It was just awesome. And uh, that whole, you know, there was a bunch of stuff like that. So sorry I went long-winded, but you guys can edit this. No, 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 we're not going to edit that. That's amazing. Yeah, well, I love, uh, you know, I've never worked on a movie, but I've gotten to be involved in projects where big groups of people come together to try to put something on that entertains or, you know, and, and there's something where you develop that sense of family and camaraderie. And, you know, when it's finally over with, it's a, it's a crazy process and a crazy feeling. And I'm going to ask you more about that in just a minute. Um, but I was doing math cause I was looking at when you started Paramount versus how old you were. So you started like super young, um, at Paramount, didn't you? 19 years old, 18 turning 19. Yep. And, and how'd that happen? So many people, that's their dream, and you made it a reality. Yeah, so all these stories, these little anecdotes were in uh, uh, a seminar that I used to do. So they probably sound canned because I would I would tell them a lot. But um, I, I am just a random luck story. Uh, to be honest with you, I was, I was 19 years old, and I was living in New Orleans, temporarily so i would go to mardi gras and make you know money for a month and then save it up and then go back to miami where i was living miami beach um and while i was there one one, about nine o'clock in the morning i was coming off an overnight shift of you know selling cocktails and hustling jello shots and all the stuff people do at mardi gras uh and I I smoked cigarettes at the time and a fellow was sort of window shopping across the street and he sort of motioned and said, Hey, do you have a light? Cause he had a cigarette, no lighter. So I let him use my lighter, make a long story short. We ended up going around the corner for two hours and sitting at this really cool coffee shop named Caldi's. And I went on and on and on about all the movies I was going to write and all the films I was going to make and all the things I wanted to do. And he was very nice and it was a great conversation, but he never really indicated, you know, what he did until uh, we sort of wrapped it up. So, well, I got to go. And and he put his business card down and said, if you're ever looking for work, let me know. So being a 19 year old kid, I shove it in my pocket, whatever. A week later, I'm doing laundry or what, what have you. I come across the card again. I finally look at it. Zv Small, senior vice president in charge of production, Paramount Pictures. So like the third guy on the rug. And needless to say, I I scrounged up a bunch of quarters because that's what it took in those days to make a, a phone call. <laughs> he got on a payphone and and uh, called him and and you know there's a more excitement to the story, but I think that's that sort of gives you the the quick tale. You know, I spent some some time. Uh, quite a bit of time inside the studio system. I was put in a position, which is most people would have thought is bottom of the rung. It's called a runner. My job was to, to be available to move stuff around the lot. So if a lawyer needed a, a number blessed from an accountant, I would go grab an envelope, run from the lawyer's office to the accountant's office, and then they would look at it and sign off and I'd run it back, things like that. Uh, but Zvi told me some really great advice. He said, photocopy everything and I did. And so uh, I was able to to consume and, and observe some of the top legal work inside the film industry. 
agency agreements and memos and and finance agreements and et cetera, and really learn the business from the inside of a, a studio uh, while getting political cover and allowed to be a 19-year-old schmuck who fails forward and does stupid things and still keeps his opportunity. So that's sort of how I got started. But then, you know, then it was a it was a 20-year grind after that of, you know, making a go as a, a, a more often than not failing film finance guy and once in a while getting a good project together and Till now, where I'm, I'm sort of green lighting my own stuff. Uh, Thirty years into my career, um, finally, you know, because of my wife, I'm writing and producing and directing uh, my own stuff rather than just working on finance and distribution of other people's stuff. And and really love the the world of Davy Crockett and the history of Davy Crockett and the history of Tennessee and the history of America and the history of um, individual liberty and the history of strong family units that are willing to fight and die for each other um and not you know uh be split by by uh temporary sort of insignificant disagreements or needs or desires and um and so i think this story fits the bill for a time right now where you know, look, change is, is inevitable. Cultural change is inevitable. Um, you know, but but the strength of our nation has always been built on the government enshrines our individual liberties. It does not grant them to us. And, you know, a lot of people have been miseducated for a couple of generations now to not really... Uh, connect with that as part of our identity. And that's the thing I love most about the Davy Crockett story. Um, outside of, you know, being old enough to, you know, remember the Fess Parker days and the Disney stuff. And as a kid, we'd, we'd run through the woods and, and, you know, shoot bears and, and, you know, all that kind of stuff. What, what got you beyond the uh, Disney fied version of Davy Crockett that most people connect with and then just leave it there. You obviously dug deeper into the man himself. Uh, what do you think inspired? Yeah. That? Uh, well, I read his, his autobiography, uh, which to me was the most informative because while there weren't a lot of, uh, you know, details about his time in the set in the house of uh, representatives or, things of that nature. It was really a lot about how he lived in his community and how he hunted and how he, how he lived on the land, which to me spoke more to the soul of the man than, than a lot of like, well, what, what did he do immediately after the war of 1812 and what, why did he fail at, you know, X, Y, Z business and all those sort of timeline beats are great, but, but actually his autobiography serves to really go into into the soul of the man a little bit because he was very connected with uh, the human struggle. You know, he had been through peonage as a child. Um, he had, you know, uh, he had been with men starving and, and fighting to feed themselves. And, and those circumstances will connect you back to the human condition awfully quick compared to today where everyone is just, you know, food shows up magically. We live we live like the Jetsons, to be honest. I don't know if you guys are old enough to remember the Jetsons, but you can literally push a button now and food shows up in a little portal called a door. And uh, I mean, anything you want, you know. And um, and I think that has, has obfuscated the human condition for a lot of people. And and uh, this movie is, is a fun movie meant for, you know, fathers and their 13 year old sons to hang out and watch it together. And it's exciting and it's interesting and it's fun. And there's nothing, there's no, there's no topics that a parent may be forced to discuss with their child before they think they might be ready. And, um, and to me, that's really important. We'll, uh, we'll share the synopsis that's been provided in the, in the notes. Uh, so mm -hmm. I won't ask you to go into all that and, and we'll uh, talk a little bit about that. 
um, down where people can read it. And of course, they'll be able to find it all online. Talk to, so we won't go into that. But uh, in general, what is just like the elevator uh, speech of what the movie, what aspect of David Crockett is the movie about? Well, it's a historical fiction that attempts from in my imagination to give some origin stories to several of the larger mythologies that surround him. For example, it's uh, said that he could stand 20 paces from a tree, throw a double-sided ax into it, and then split a musket ball. And that's a known mythology. Why would anyone ever need to apply that? I don't know. So, uh, And then various others. The origin of the coonskin cap is sort of unknown. Um, and so I originally set out to have a fun swashbuckling historical fiction that is um, thematically correct to the characters. He's represented in his views and thoughts very accurately as is Andrew Jackson and many others from that time period who appear in the film. Um, but the storyline itself is, is condensed and fictionalized so that we can convey information in a fun, exciting way. So for folks who are, who are expecting, um, a historical documentary about the life of David Crockett, they can uh, read a book because this is not that. Well, and also there are several, there are several great biography documentary series and he appears in many other tele like there's, there's plenty of that stuff to consume for sure. I, I, right. I hope they're able to find it and find what they're looking for because that's a worthy pursuit too. I, um, this film is not that though. It's as simple as that. It's just, it's uh it's a uh, it's a film for fathers and sons to hang out and watch together. Now let's talk about the uh, uh, trying to find Davy Crockett. Uh, oh boy! What, what was the what was that process like? It was incredibly easy. The entire time I wrote it, I had one person in mind. Very luckily, that person said yes, and we went and made the movie. <laughs> and uh, for folks who don't know yet, uh, it's uh, Peter. Pavinci from the Chronicles of Narnia fame. So um the character's name, yeah. His his the actor's name is William Mosley. Yeah. William Mosley. Yeah, he's he's a big deal. I I uh, you know, my daughter do I have daughters and they yeah. loved all of those. So he's his his performances have been in my house for years. So yeah. um that's that's really cool. So uh he accepted and then what were the challenges that you guys encountered in trying to capture uh who David Crockett really was? Yeah. Um, physicality is obviously the first place he would have to start. Uh, being proficient uh, on a horse. Um, you know, there's a lot of running up hill, mountainsides, and biting and tumbling and tossing and turning. And uh, but there also has to be a gentle, gentle nature, which I think Davy Crockett had a, a certain gentle nature that was encapsulated that really tough interior when he needed it, in my opinion. And I don't know. I see you have on the background around there some Davy Crockett member. Billy. You might have an opinion of your own about what his personality was like. But, you know, he was a storyteller, um, uh, a big sort of a larger than life personality and and had a toughness underneath that a lot of people underestimated probably. Yeah. Both mentally that, that's really, that's really interesting to imagine, um, to imagine um, trying to create the personality of somebody who is so well known in an iconic way. Um, so that's interesting uh, to imagine what that must've been like for the two of you when he started mm -hmm. the scenes. Okay. When we get back, I'm going to ask you a little bit about filming in Tennessee. With nine branches in West Tennessee and nationwide ATM and branch access, you can take Leaders Credit Union with you wherever you go. From checking accounts, credit cards, home loans, and their state-of-the-art mobile app, Banking with Leaders can help you move forward. Learn more and see how you can qualify for membership at LeadersCU.com. Leaders is insured by the NCUA. I hope you're enjoying the Real Foot Forward podcast from Discovery Park of America. If you are, Please be sure to subscribe, rate, and leave a positive review on iTunes, Spotify, 
or wherever you listen to podcasts. This is your host, Scott Williams, and our guest today is Derek Purvis, producer, director of the just-released action pick, The Ballad of Davy Crockett, and we've been um, having a great conversation about the movie. Uh, did you feel like it was important to film this in Tennessee? Uh, yeah, it was extremely important. Um, you know, William Mosley did a great job. He did uh, all of the fight sequences he did on his own outside of a couple of really dangerous moments that, you know, we had to, for safety precaution and that sort of stuff. Um, but being in the, in, in the terrain and the environment where, you know, Davey actually lived was very important. Um, not just because of the look is somewhat, I mean, it's, it's really difficult to replicate some parts of Tennessee. Um, you know, uh, but I think for the for the spirit of the of the film, it was really important that it was a Tennessee product. The people here were invested, the crew, um, and that sort of thing. So it was it was, uh, and it was beautiful. And there was plenty of great locations in the state. It was great to work with. And some uh, some listeners may not realize that. Uh, states often jockey for trying to get movies into the state and provide uh, a lot of incentive. Um, did you ever shop around any other state or did you know you wanted Tennessee to begin with? Well, no, see, I've all, I really always wanted Tennessee. Um, it has a, you know, a fairly competitive tax incentive program. Uh, which is often important for independent films to be to be produced. Um, it has an, a fairly experienced crew with some really great guys. For example, James King, the director of photography, lives here in Nashville, and uh, he's incredibly talented and sought after and all that sort of stuff. And and um, no, I, I never really did shop it around. Which okay. maybe it's a good business, but I just I wanted it to be made in Tennessee, and with that's by Dern, that's what we did. And you're you're based out of uh, Nashville now. Yeah, we've been here seven years. We lived in Nashville. Okay, great. Uh, what what do you find? Me, my buddies tell me in in uh, thirteen years I might be able to start calling myself a Tennessean. <laughs> no, I'll hey I'll call you that now. Um, what um what's the difference between uh taking care of business in Nashville versus being in LA or New York? Well, can you be more specific? Like um Yeah, just the just the uh process of being creative and of being in the industry. Do you find that you know you brush up against others in the industry enough to where you keep your creative fires burning? Yeah. Well, you know, um there's there's pros and cons I guess to both in in Los Angeles if you're making an independent film the the market rate for products and services and labor has uh a, has a a realistic sort of grade on it so that you can conduct business as an independent filmmaker and make a living which is very you know difficult to do um the thing about being in Nashville, the only criticism I might say is everyone here has been padded with the luxury of uh, having, for example, a million and a half dollars and two weeks to shoot a 30 second or I'm sorry, a three minute piece of content for uh, a music video, which is a significantly different prospect than having uh, three million dollars and four weeks to come away with, you know, an hour and a half's worth of material. It's just two different realities. Um, and and I think that that adjustment can happen very quickly. Everyone that I've met here is incredibly bright, talented, and, and, and uh, you know, the, the thing is, and I've been saying this a lot for some reason, there's a fascination here, and that's great. Uh, uh, but um, I've said it on the radio a couple of times, but... Uh, you know, everyone thinks about growing the film industry from the perspective of tax incentives. We have to be more competitive with Georgia, which has up to 30% and various other things uh, and a larger fund. So more films can come. You know, the truth is um, 
when I was in my financing phase in the late 90s, early 2000s, Massachusetts was one of the early adopters of a state level tax incentive. And I know exactly what happens because I've lived through it. You start the incentive, major Hollywood films come, you get a small production community that lives there now and gets hired. But when that film leaves, the intellectual property leaves with it and the money leaves with it. And the city or the state of Massachusetts then had 100 or 300 or 500, whatever number of unemployed temporary workers waiting for another film to just pick their, their place to come and work. And so that creates its own set of challenges. To me, and I think that, you know, the, the folks in the economic development are keen with this, I, I think. Uh, but what a community really needs before the tax incentive is a handful of companies that are good at creating and monetizing content. Hmm. So everyone goes, look what how great Atlanta did. And what they don't really realize is that Ted Turner selected Atlanta and put CNN and TNT and TBS, and they had major production studios sitting there long before the tax incentive ever came along. And there was already an entire production community f- feeding that beast. And so the tax incentive only then added, ah, and now the people working at the studio can in the summer do a film. and do-. So to me, that's the model that I should be focused on is we need, and you know, look, Daily Wire's here now and they're, they're doing, presumably doing very well. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, you know, several other sort of groups have come. There's little tiny insignificant guys like me that make a film every year or two, every, you know, a couple, two, three years. Um, so, so that's what I have to say about the, the development of the film industry in Tennessee. And, um, and that I guess that's similar to making a film which is a lot like building a black hole. You know, I, I had a Davy Crockett film idea. I was one little piece of antimatter. And then I got, you know, someone else to believe in that. Now there was two particles, then a third person. And before you know it, the gravity of this group of people becomes undeniable and it, it you know, can take off. And that's sort of what has to happen with the, the community here. And you then, know, you, and then you, get, part, you, you finish... Yeah. And then you start the promotional ball rolling and all of that. How long ago did you shoot the last scene versus you just now are opening the movie? Well, shoot the last scene or edit the last frame? <laughs> edit the last frame. Let's go with that. Uh, I guess nine or ten months ago, yeah. Yeah, so it takes a long time for it to yeah. get through before, the process. This one took four years. Wow. Yeah, this one took four years. And, you know, I think part of the growth of the – the industry and I, you know, hopefully I'm not making enemies in my area here, but a lot of the content creators I talk to don't have not yet adjusted. We're talking about not really understanding that, you know, film is a, is a, is done by human energy, not by money. Yes. You can have $60 million and, and buy your way out of all your problems, but most independent films need to be, two or three or four million dollars top so you're just not going to make any money anymore and so there's a lot of people i've met here that are walking around looking for 10 15 20 million to make a movie and it's great in your mind that you're thinking like you're going to compete with you know warner brothers and you know all the district but honestly <clears throat> there are baby steps to get to that number one number two that's a high risk game unless you have several billion dollars to absorb losses of two or three or four films in a row on that scale. And that's, and we're not talking avatar or, you know, $200 million budget. I'm just talking 20, 30 million, because guess what? You have to spend 20, 30, 40 million to now market that, or you're never going to make the money back. So there's just a disconnect, I think, from the actual business of film still that this town needs to grow through. But what do I know? So you've watched it now on the big screen with people is, is it when you're watching a movie that you've birthed from the very beginning, do you see things that you wish you had done different or do you even see, do you even watch it? Well, I mean, it's a fun question, but uh, yes, I watch it. Um, I've never understood 
people who don't watch their stuff because that's kind of like a painter not looking at his painting when it's done, you know, right. it's beautiful. <laughs> Right. To make, to make sure I think I like it or should I make any changes? I don't know. Um, but yeah, uh, I've watched it. You know, there's Mark Scorsese had a great quote. I believe it was Mark Scorsese. And if I'm misattributing the quote, I apologize to everyone. You don't have to put in their comments that I'm an idiot. <laughs> you can just assume they know I'm an idiot. But I think it was Mark Scorsese who said uh, that you can't film excuses. Hmm. And I could probably sit here for two hours and tell you all the things that went wrong and and et cetera. And I will sum it up and say, you know what? I think uh I think God gave us a little help to get this thing done. It's a finished film. Is did it come was the execution what I envisioned? Not necessarily. Uh, but I'm definitely oh you know, satisfied with the film. It holds up, it's a good story, um, it connects together great has a nice payoff at the end with a you know bunch of action and fighting and all that sort of stuff. Getting a lot of great uh a lot of great uh buzz. I've seen a lot of real positive comments, but I'm I can't wait to see it myself. Yeah, you know, I, I actually uh I'm waiting for the other shoe to drop with the critics. Because <laughs> it's kind of early, but the first like eight or ten, they've all been not deadly. They're not slicing, you know, decapitating the movie. And so right. I'm I'll take it. A little, a little jab in the gut. Okay, fine, I can take that. <laughs> you know, that's what that's what they think they're supposed to do. Um, yeah, but no, it's good. overall. Yeah, they're good. Critics have a great uh, responsibility to uh, to the audience. You know, a lot like uh, like a pop song or a good rock song. Um, there's a there's a relationship between the artist and the and the consumer that's built on history. When you go to a rock show, there's an expectation as an audience member and this, the, the band has to meet that. Um, if you go to a, if you go to a, you know, Taylor Swift concert and, and she starts doing really bad polka, she's broken that relationship with you. Right. So uh, in a similar way, film, film has, a series of set expectations that the audience is a language that the audience can understand. And this film, I think hits a few of those notes pretty well. Is now that you're done, um, you probably think of David Crockett as like an old friend from, from high school or, you know, somebody oh. that you, do you, do you think about him that way? No, I mean, I still filled with wonder and curiosity because I can never truly know the guy, you know, uh, and I'm not, uh, even though I'm a filmmaker, I try hard to remind myself to not be self-important and self-absorbed and and confuse myself into thinking that because I've made a movie, I understand history, you know, and make silly statements like Ridley Scott. Someone writes a book 400 years ago. Uh, so, um, yeah, I don't know what I was talking about. I, I had to stop myself from going down a path I didn't want to go down. Sorry. <laughs> No, that's great. Well, I, I really appreciate you making this movie. Um, I, of course, we here at Discovery Park have all kinds of, uh, uh, we have a David Crockett exhibit and a statue, and we have a David Crockett birthday celebration every year. So, of course, you're invited to that, to join us oh, for that. We're come to that for sure. Yeah, good, good. It's, uh, you know, David Crockett is a part of our uh, DNA here. And so, you know, we love the fact that you're, you know, letting people know about, uh, you know, who we think of as our, our hometown hero. So thank you for that. Are we appreciate from Jackson. Huh? Are you from, from Jackson, Tennessee? No, we're uh union city. Um, and so that far? yeah, we're in the far Northwest corner. And so he settled here in 1822. Um, and he stayed here until he left, uh, Tennessee for the Alamo. So he, he was our, you know, my ancestors go all the way back to Tennessee. And so he was their representative. Um, so I think that's pretty cool. So, uh, it's really yeah, cool. yeah. And he, he, uh, real foot Lake is near here. And, uh, David Crockett was one of the first, uh, settlers to actually hunt around, uh, real foot Lake. So there's a lot of firsts with David Crockett, uh, here in our community. So we're really excited for the rest of the world to get to see. I more really hope it represents him well. Keep in mind, it's historical fiction. 
Yeah. It's just designed to reintroduce the character to a new generation of kids and just sort of tease that. So I have, you know, when we talk about more historically accurate, the idea with this is three films, three feature films with 10 episode limited series wedged in between each two. Mm. It's sort of, this was sort of the big chocolate piece to kick it off and entice the audience into taking a bite, you know? Uh, and then it, we'll have more chance with, with history and that sort of stuff. And, and then end with the Alamo, of course. You know, I, f I feel like I know him. And so I have a sense of pride that you're bringing him forward for lots of people to be. Oh, there's a lot of pressure. I guess you should have seen the movie before we did this. <laughs> no, 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 no. I know it's, uh, it's uh historic fiction and, you know, just the fact that you've, you know, I watched the trailers and stuff, you know, man, it looks great. I, That's uh, the story. The trailer represents the story pretty straightforward. There's no surprises or twists. Um, I did have to modernize. So he wrote uh, a letter to Andrew Jackson rescinding his support for the Indian Removal Act. Right. And uh, it was very clunky. I don't know if you remember the letter. It's very, oh, very of course. I English. actually have it. I have the letter in the in the book. So I paraphrased it to try to modernize the language a little bit, kept the themes and 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 then so that's how we end the movie is the, the recitation of that. But oh wow. Yeah, that's great. And I think it's I mean it's very telling, you know, who he was and what he was about and you know, the work that he did to try to save land for the squatters. And, you know, he, he definitely was a fascinating character. Um, and the antithesis to Andrew Jackson back in the day. Um, so anyway, it's, uh, I, I can't wait for folks to see it. I know they're really gonna, um, really gonna enjoy it. Um, and thank you for, for giving us today. Cause I know you're in the middle of a lot of stuff going on with this movie. Uh, people can see it. Um, it's in theaters now. And then, uh, I'm assuming at some point it's going to be hitting, uh, the Netflix or Hulu or wherever, um, yeah, right now it's it's uh, it's in select theaters and anywhere you can buy movies. So right. whether that's Amazon or Apple iTunes or Vudu, uh, if you have Comcast or if you have Dish or whatever, wherever you normally buy a movie, it's available. Um, some of those you've got to search still because it hasn't made its way into the algorithm. Uh, Amazon is moving its way up. Um so the more searching that people do for it, the better it'll be for the film to get more visibility, all that sort of stuff. Um, and and uh, and then, yes, it'll go through the, the full life cycle, end up somewhere on a streamer. Awesome. Hey, this has been incredible. I cannot wait to meet you in person up here yeah, at same. Discovery Park. And I'll show you the David Crockett exhibit. Um, and we'll, we'll talk all about David Crockett. So uh, you, you have an invitation anytime. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. I really do. Okay, man. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thanks to all you listeners who've joined us today at Discovery Park of America. Our mission here is to inspire children and adults to see beyond. To plan an experience here for you and your family, visit discoveryparkofamerica.com. 